Someone asked me, why do you always laugh? You're always laughing when you say good morning. I'm like, well, if you knew what happened beforehand, you know why I'm laughing, you know? It's like, like a circus, you know? There's always something going on before we get to this point that, uh, and I'm just so excited. I'm laughing. I'm so excited because I get to preach, and I really do love that. Um, today's a very special day. It is the first Sunday after Passover, which is the Feast of First Fruits. And we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to talk about the Jewish feasts and the significance they have to us as Christians. I think you're aware that today around the world, hundreds and thousands, literally, of people in churchianity are celebrating Easter. Now, let me say a little bit about Easter. I know, I know. People say, well, you've got to you know, come against everything. I, just, I think this is important, so hear me out. The name Easter has its roots in ancient polytheistic religions. I think about on this subject, pretty much all scholars are agreed, but there's a lot of disagreement as to exact origin, where it comes from. One origin of Easter dates back to um, ancient times not long after the global flood. Nimrod, who was a grandson of Noah, <coughs> had turned from following his grandfather's God and became a tyrannical ruler. Some trace Easter back to the springtime ritual instituted by Samaramis, his wife, following the death of Tammuz, their son. Contemporary traditions such as the Easter bunny and Easter eggs can be traced to the practices established by Samaramis. Now, though the name Easter is clearly pagan, it comes from a pagan god. It comes from Ashtoreth, which 1 Kings 11.5 calls the goddess of the Zidonians, and 2 Kings 23.13 calls the abomination of the Zidonians, Christians have come to call today Easter. And they celebrate the same way the pagans do. Bunnies and eggs and candy and baskets. There's a church by my house that said, Resurrection Sunday, and I thought, oh cool. And then below it it said, Easter egg hunt after service. And I'm not we just mix it all up. I think we trivialize it, people. Listen to what God said to the nation Israel. Exodus 23, 13. <coughs> now concerning everything which I have said to you, be on your guard and do not mention the name of other gods, nor let them be heard from your mouth. So God tells Israel, don't even mention the name of pagan gods. But the church has a celebration that's named after a pagan god. Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. And I just think, like I said, I think we trivialize the significance of this day and, and what and it stands for, resurrection. What's Christian about Easter? Nothing. Easter is a pagan holiday. It was brought in by Constantine and, you know, adopted by the church, and we just, it just kind of stuck. There's nothing about Easter in the Bible now unless you're using a King James Version. If you use the King James Version, in Acts 12.4, it says, intending after Easter to bring Him forth to the people. It is a horrible translation. The Greek word there is Peshka, which is Passover. Intending after Passover to bring Him, they stuck Easter in there. And so people say, well, see, it's right in the Easter's in the Bible. It's never mentioned by the Lord, never talked about by the apostles, never observed by the early church. But this is a significant day. <coughs> Very important day in history, but it has nothing to do with Easter and all the pagan trappings that go on. You know, we can't take what the world does and Christianize it and keep doing it the same way. We've got to be different in what we do. We have to stand apart. And, you know, and I know we, this is so part of our culture that it's just, you know, Pat Robertson, who you could throw a stone and hit his palace, you know, right across the highway here, his compound. Pat says that Easter is the church's high holy day. I'm like, I didn't know the church had high holy days. You know, I didn't know that. And certainly, if it had one, it wouldn't be called Easter. Now, first fruits, maybe, because that's what. It's called in the Bible this day. Well, let's talk a little bit about the feasts of Israel because 
these feasts, of which today is first fruits, picture God's redemptive plan. And that's why this day is so important. And that's why I don't want to trivialize it and turn it into a circus with all the things that the world does to it. Because this day is not about bunnies or colored eggs or baskets full of candy or dressing up. It's about resurrection from the dead. Overcoming death. And that is significant. So this morning I want us to look at the, the biblical significance of the feast days. These feast days are talked about throughout the Bible. But only in Leviticus 23 are they all listed in chronological order. So we're going to look at them in Leviticus 23. Now, before we get there, does anybody know what's the first feast? Passover, thank you. What's the second one? Unleavened bread. The third one? First fruits. Fourth? No. Fourth? Come on. Pentecost. There we go. The fifth one is? Trumpets. <laughs> the sixth one? Unleavened bread. And the final one is tabernacles. Now here's something to think about. Look where Day of Atonement is. Passover, Day of Atonement's at the end. What's the significance of that? Well, we'll talk about it, alright? The study of the feast is a study in typology. Now, typology is the interpretation of First Testament events, persons, and ceremonies that prefigure Christ's fulfillment in the New Testament. <coughs> now, fundamentally, these seven feasts represent and typify the sequence, timing, and significance of the major events of the Lord's redemptive career. They started Calvary, where Jesus voluntarily gave Himself for the sins of the world. That's Passover. And they climax at the consummation of the Messianic Kingdom at the second coming of Christ. These seven feasts picture the entire redemptive career of Messiah. We could call these seven feasts the Christ event. See, people want to separate the first and second coming by thousands of years. Hopefully you'll see in the feast that cannot be done. When you follow these feasts in chronological order, they give such deep roots to the preterist interpretation of eschatology. And this is the Christ event. He came once, He came again within a 40-year period, and we'll see how that fits in here. Let's look at the first one in Leviticus 23.4. It says, these are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. The first feast is Passover. This is the foundational feast. And the typical significance of the Passover is very clear in the New Testament writings. There's probably no Mosaic institution of more perfect type than this one. It's to happen on the first month on the 14th day of the month. This is the 14th of the Hebrew month, Nizon. <clears throat> so the first Passover, as the children of Israel are getting ready to leave bondage in Egypt, was celebrated on the 14th of Nizon. Then, almost 2,000 years later, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is sacrificed on the 14th of Nizon. The very same day. And while Israel is celebrating their Passover, Jesus, the true Lamb of God, is being crucified. He was the Lamb of God, which the ancient Passover Lamb typified. He died to save us from the judgment of God as the Lamb died to save the children of Israel from the judgment of God. Very significant feast. And, and we're briefly going to run through these because I want to get all seven because I want you to see the whole picture. If you want more in-depth study, go on our website and we dealt with these more individually there. Much more in-depth. <clears throat> the second feast is called Unleavened Bread. Leviticus 23.6 Then on the 15th day of the same month, there's a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days it shall, you shall eat unleavened bread. So God appointed the Feast of Unleavened Bread to begin the very next day after Passover. Now, when you get to the New Testament, they have kind of combined these two, and often they'll call it the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and they're referring to Passover and Unleavened Bread. They kind of made one out of these two, but biblically they are separated. And this happens the very next day. It happens on the 15th of that same month of Nizon, the Hebrew month. <clears throat> 
It was to last for seven days. And the first and the last days of the feast were recognized as high Sabbath days. We see that in Leviticus 23.7. It says, On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. On the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation. So on the first night, again on the seventh, they're to have this high Sabbath day. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictures the burial of Messiah and His sinless life. On this feast, the Israelites would put grain into the ground and then pray that God would bring forth a harvest for the coming year. The Hebrews would pray, give us life out of the earth. And so as they put grain in the ground, they're praying this prayer. What was happening to Jesus on this feast as every Israelite was praying, give us life out of the earth as they were burying Him? Think about that. They're putting Jesus in the tomb and they're praying, give us life out of the earth. <clears throat> as with the other feasts of the Lord, Leviticus 23 the prophetic meaning of this Feast of Unleavened Bread is found in the work of Messiah. And that's what these feasts are all about. These feasts are all about Jesus Christ. They teach us about Christ. Passover pictures the substitutionary death of the Messiah. Unleavened Bread pictures the burial of the Messiah. And the third feast, which is today, is called First Fruits. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land which I am going to give you, and reap its harvest. Then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, what day does this feast to take place on? No date? It says on the day after the Sabbath. Now, Passover is to take place on the 14th of Nisan. Unleavened bread takes place on the 15th of Nisan, the very next day. And first fruit is the day after the Sabbath. See, there's no date given. And you think, why, why don't you just say the 16th? Why not say that? Well, the inspired text says on the day after the Sabbath. Now, here's the problem. Most scholars say that the Feast of First Fruits took place on the 16th of Nisan. And I'm like, because they take the Sabbath there to be the Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread. So the first day of unleavened bread is a Sabbath, so after the Sabbath would be the very next day, that would be the 16th. And to me, just say the 16th then. And we'll know when it is. We won't have any problem. Why doesn't he say that? Well, I believe the reason he doesn't give a date here is because the Sabbath is not the Sabbath of unleavened bread. It's the weekly Sabbath. And see, because it's the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday, first fruits is always on Sunday. It's different dates depending on the year, but it's always Sunday. So he didn't give a date because the date changes. But it's always Sunday. There's only two feasts that don't have dates. And that's first fruits because it's Sunday after the Passover and the date changes. And the feast following it. Pentecost doesn't have a date because it's 50 days after first fruit. So you've got to find out when first fruit was, and then you've got to go 50 days to get that. Now, <clears throat> I used to believe that Jesus died on a Wednesday, and I've taught that. Okay? I'm changing my mind, I think. I think. I think I'm going with Thursday. I'm not going with Friday, trust me. I'm, you know, Friday's too traditional. I couldn't go with tradition. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> I really do, I, the more, I used to go with the Wednesday day, but the more I studied this, I really think Thursday biblically kind of lines up because of some other things that are going on in Scripture. See, if Jesus died on Thursday, and if Thursday was the 14th of Nisan, in the year that Jesus was crucified, and I think there's biblical evidence that the resurrection took place on the 17th of Nisan in that year. Look at me at Genesis chapter 8. <clears throat> it says, But God remembered Noah, and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused the wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky was restrained, and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. So God's judgment is seen here in the flood as it was at Calvary. 
And as God's promise of life is found in the resurrection, so here we see new life, a new beginning as the ark rested on Mount Ararat. And notice what day it landed on Ararat. The 17th day of the 7th month. Now, this was the month Nizon. You say, well, the Bible says it's Nizon the first month. God changed the calendar in Exodus. Okay, When He instituted the feast, when he, when he dealt with the children of Israel, when He gave them the law, He literally changed the calendar and He made this the first month. <clears throat> so, why does God give us exact date that the ark touched the land? Well, I think it's because the date is significant. It's the same date of Jesus' resurrection. We know that the ark pictured deliverance from judgment. The same thing the resurrection pictures. Uh, pictures. All right? This date may also be the very same day that the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea according to Exodus 13.8. So another significant event on the 17th. Because that also pictured deliverance. New life. It also appears that Israel ate the first fruits in the promised land on the 17th. So I think all these things kind of help me to, to see that I think he died on a Thursday. The resurrection was on a 17th in that year. And these are pictures, they're types pointing to the anti-type, the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so Passover occurs on the 14th, unleavened bread on the 15th, and last of the 22nd. The first fruits occurs the day after the weekly Sabbath or Sunday, which is the first day of the week. So first fruits is always, as I said, always on a Sunday. As to the significance of the feast of first fruits, I think there's no doubt about it. It pictures the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're celebrating today. It's a resurrection Sunday. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. And after that, those who are Christ at His coming. So Christ is clearly, His resurrection is the first fruits. He is the first fruits resurrection and He rose from the dead on the Jewish feast of first fruit. So Passover pictures the death of Messiah, His substitutionary death. He is the Passover Lamb. The Feast of Unleavened Bread pictures His burial. And the feast that follows, the first fruits pictures resurrection from the dead. You see anything going on in those feasts there? You see the Gospel in the feast that the Lord demonstrates here? we got Jesus' death, burial. This was predicted 15 to 1600 years before it ever happened. <clears throat> that it would happen this way. And it just so happened that He dies on the 14th, the same day as Passover. It just so happens He's resurrected on first fruits. Just a coincidence, right? Listen, God is trying to show us a picture of redemption. Listen, year after year, Israel lived out these feasts. God is showing them in picture form over and over. And guess what happens when Jesus dies on Passover? They're celebrating Passover and they miss the whole thing. They're like, they don't get it. So hundreds of years before Christ is ever born, God is teaching His people that their Messiah would come and He would die for them on Passover, the 14th of Nisan. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God was teaching people that for three days Jesus would be in the tomb and then He would rise from the dead on the first day of the week, the very day that Israel celebrated first fruits. You know, this is so significant because prophecy proves the trustworthiness of the Bible. I mean, God said certain things are going to happen and they happen just exactly as He said He did. You know, there's no other book in the world that contains the kind of specific prophecies that are found throughout the pages of the Bible. <clears throat> 1,500 years before Christ's resurrection, God predicted in type and shadow that Jesus would be crucified on the 14th, would raised from the dead three days later, and it happened just like He said. Jesus not only defeated death for Himself, but He promised resurrection life to all who put their trust in Him. Look at what He said. <clears throat> John 11:25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in Me shall live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in Me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said, Yes, Lord. I believe that You are the Christ, the Son of God, even He who comes into the world. 
In verse 26, he asks her, do you believe this? What is this? Well, it's the statement that he just gave of himself, that he's the resurrection, he's the life. Whoever puts their trust in him will have eternal life. But that's not all he asked her to believe. Jesus is basically saying here, I guarantee eternal life to everyone who puts their trust in me. To believe that Jesus is the Christ is in essence to believe that He is the guarantor of eternal life to all who come to Him. <clears throat> because of the resurrection, people, those words carry a lot of weight. You know, they wouldn't carry that kind of weight. If Jesus, he predicted that and then He died and he stayed in the grave. They're like, well, He couldn't do much for Himself. Why should we trust in Him? But when He came out of that grave, it gives proof, verification to everything that He said. You know, if he remained in the grave, there'd be a lot of questions, but the resurrection answers those questions and the argument is over. The tomb is empty. And you know, if you want to have, if you want to question the, the veracity of the resurrection, those guys, those 12 disciples went out and died. Gave their life. These guys were a bunch of chickens, a bunch of babies. Remember when they came to the garden and they captured Jesus? What'd they do? They all ran and hid. And then after the resurrection, all of a sudden now they're brave and they're willing to give their lives. Why? Because they knew the truth of the resurrection. And they were willing to give their life for it. These, these men were transformed about this. <clears throat> Jesus has power over death. So I guess that means He's everything that He claimed to be. Now, the fourth feast, <clears throat> it's called the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost is the Greek name. It's known in Hebrew as Shavuot. And it's called the Feast of Weeks because God specifically told the sons of Jacob they were to count seven weeks from first fruits, and then the day after <clears throat> was this fourth feast to be observed. It's in Leviticus 23, 15. It says, You shall also count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day when you brought in the sheaves of the wave offering, there shall be seven complete Sabbaths. You shall count fifty days to the day after the seventh day, and then you shall present a grain offering to the Lord. So seven weeks are forty-nine days. You add one the day after, it brings you to fifty days. This is the fourth feast, and it was to occur precisely fifty days after first fruits, after Jesus' resurrection. Now, Shavuot... For the Hebrew, marked the beginning of the summer wheat harvest. Just as Israel's early feast of first fruits marked the beginning of the spring barley harvest. In the Greek language, Shavuot was known as Pentecost, meaning 50th. And since it was celebrated on the 50th day from the feast of first fruits, they, it's 50 days. It had the fragrance of Jubilee. You know, reading through your First Testament, you get this, the 50-day concept was a Jubilee year. Debts were to be freed. Well, that's the idea, releasing of the captives. Now, I can't prove it, but I believe that AD 70 was a jubilee year. All debts were forgiven. From the works of Josephus, there's a record that 6970 was a sabbatical year, which could suggest that AD 70 was a jubilee year. It would fit really perfectly, you know, with the idea of all debts be for, being forgiven, as a fact, our sins being forgiven. But a very notable historical event happened on the first Shavuot. Now see, we saw all these different feasts, you know, had their significance. Passover, the Jews celebrated that, then they did unleavened bread, and then first fruits and Shavuot. That was the giving of the Ten Commandments. That's a significant event. In other words, at Shavuot, God is entering into covenant with Israel. The old covenant. They were His people. Now the rabbis have gone through the arithmetic and the Torah and come to the conclusion many, many years ago that the law was given on Sinai, on Shavuot, was 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. So they associate the Feast of Weeks as the feast where God gave the Torah. This is seen as the birthday of God's covenant relationship with Israel. Shavuot is when they became His people, He became their God. They entered into this covenant. Now, so far we have seen that very significant Christian events happened on these Hebrew holidays. What significant Christian event happened on Shavuot? The church was born. Here the Old Covenant began. The New Covenant began as the Israelites entered in 
to Pentecost, which is again, is just the Greek name. That was the giving of the living Torah. When on this day, when Israel is celebrating Shavuot, they're celebrating their birth, their, their union with God in covenant, this very same day the church comes into being. You know what kind of gets me that, you know, you got the dispensationalists who say the church and Israel are totally separate. Well, isn't it significant that every one of these Hebrew holidays, the church, significant events for the church happen on these days? The church is literally born on a Hebrew holiday. How do we keep them separate? We don't keep them separate. Look at uh, <clears throat> Acts 2. Dealing with Pentecost, it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven. So this is the day of Pentecost. This is the Hebrew festival Shavuot on this day. And Pentecost is taking place. Suddenly there's this violent rushing wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So these Jews had gathered together at the temple to celebrate, celebrate Shavuot. But our Lord had something different in mind this year, something very significant. For these people, this is the day that believing Jews became part of the first fruits, members of the church, God's church, the church of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Christian scholars mark this historic Pentecost in Jerusalem as the spiritual birthday of the church. Is it just some kind of coincidence that all these things are falling into place? All these things are happening on the same day? Fifty days after the first fruits feast in Egypt, the law was given to the nation Israel at Mount Sinai, written on tables of stone. And fifty days after the final first fruits, the resurrection of Christ, the law was given to the church, the Israel of God, written upon their hearts by the Spirit of God. Both the giving of the law at Mount Sinai and the giving of the new covenant through the Holy Spirit to the 120 in the temple were events that occurred on the very same day of the lunar calendar, the day of Pentecost. Now to natural Israel, Passover was their freedom from bondage under Egypt. Exodus chapter 12. Unleavened bread was the separation from the land of Egypt. And then they went through the baptism in the Red Sea and came out miraculously on the other side. Finally, God led the people to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 where, he, where they experienced Pentecost. God revealed Himself to the people in a deeper and greater way than He did previously. And as we have seen, these four spring festivals were fulfilled by Jesus who is the Passover lamb, who died on the day of Passover. He was without doubt buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was in the sepulcher on that day. And He was the kernel of wheat that was buried in the earth. And Jesus rose as the first fruits of the barley harvest, He Himself being the first of those to rise from the dead. Finally, the new covenant arrived during the Feast of Pentecost to gather believers in Christ to God's spring harvest in the earth. Now, all these feasts described in detail the significant events during the first coming of Messiah. And we'll find that the fall festivals give us tremendous insight and understanding into the events of the second coming. Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles. These picture the second coming. Like I said, this is the Christ event. It's not two separate things separated by thousands of years. It's within a generation. <clears throat> that this happens. Now, between Pentecost and Trumpets, there was a four-month period. And these months in between these historically were the driest months of the year, agriculturally. But they were also dry months spiritually because there was no holy convocations. There was no time when the nation gathered together at the Lord for the sanctuary. So they got this four-month break in between these feasts. And I think this gap this four-month gap can be seen prophetically in a negative way, just as the rest of the feasts are positively prophetic. The newly redeemed nation of Israel experienced Passover through Pentecost to the destruction of Jerusalem or Jericho in 40 years. They celebrated their Passover. They wandered in the wilderness 40 years. They got to the destruction of Jericho and they were in the land. Victory was theirs. 
Because of unbelief and stubbornness, many of them did not get in, except for Joshua and Caleb. They wandered in that wilderness for 40 years, and it was a different generation that entered the promised land. Thus, this four-month gap can be seen as a reminder, I think, of these 40 years, this 40-year wandering. So the exodus out of Egypt and into the promised land by the children of Israel under Moses is a direct shadow of the exodus of the New Testament generation. Now here's what most people don't understand. There's a second exodus, and Isaiah talks about a second exodus. And Jesus talked about a second exodus. It was a spiritual exodus. The second exodus ran from the cross, which when Jesus died on Passover, through to the destruction of Jerusalem. It was another 40-year period. Type and anti-type. Physical, spiritual. Let's look at some comparisons between these two 40-year periods and see the similarities that are there. The first was preceded by physical slavery. They were in bondage. The Hebrews were in bondage in Egypt. The second was preceded by spiritual slavery. Man's bondage to sin and death. They were in spiritual bondage and they needed to be set free through that 40-year period. One introduced the first Passover with the blood of lambs. The other fulfilled the type with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. So you got the lamb slain in the first one, and you got Christ slain in the second one. One brought God's people physical deliverance by crossing the Red Sea. The other brought God's people spiritual deliverance by the working of the cross of Christ. The first established a temporary covenant with God. It was the old covenant. The second established a permanent new covenant with the people of God. Fifty-five days after the first Passover in Egypt, the law was given to the nation Israel at Mount Sinai, written upon tables of stone, and 3,000 people died. Remember that? Because they were out there, you know, made a golden calf while he's getting the Ten Commandments and, you know, having a wild party, and 3,000 people died. Well, in the New Covenant, we have the same thing go on. 55 days after the final Passover, the law is given to the Israel of God, the New Covenant, and 3,000 people receive life. Again, just coincidence, all these neat coincidences in the Bible, you know? Very few people would disagree that the above points are fulfillments of shadows given at the time of the Exodus. But the correlation doesn't stop with the initial working of the Exodus, but continues with the entrance into the land of temporal rest 40 years later. And just as the children of faith were allowed to enter the temporal land of rest the first time, the children of faith in the generation directly following the cross of Christ were given entrance into the eternal land of rest. With each covenant, A 40-year transition period followed the initial act of deliverance into the entrance to the promised land. And we got cities being destroyed both times as these covenants are brought into consummation. During both periods, the people saw God do all kinds of miraculous things. If you were there, you manna every day. You know, you just go out and there it is. You know what manna means? What's it? What's it? What is it? That's what man means. What is it? We don't know what this stuff is, but we're eating it every day. God provided food for them. God provided water out of a rock. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. Forty years, all these miraculous things. Then we get to the new covenant. Did we see any miraculous stuff happen in this new covenant? People are raised from the dead. Diseases are cured. All kinds of miraculous stuff going on. You know, when they entered the land, all those miracles stopped. And when they entered the land... They stopped again. They weren't needed anymore. During both periods, the wicked were severed from among the just and not allowed to enter the land of promise. At the end of the first 40-year period, the Israelites of faith entered the temporal land of promise in which God enabled them to defeat their physical foes. At the end of the second 40-year period, salvation was complete and God's people entered their eternal promised land in which God enabled them to defeat their spiritual enemies. These feasts, as we have taught, are both literal feasts celebrated in Israel every year and types of God's prophetic calendar of events for the church at the end of the dry season. At that four-month period came the fall feast. And all three of these fall feasts took place in the month of Tishri, 
which would correspond to our September or October, depending on what year it is. The fifth feast, which is the first of the fall feasts, is the Feast of Trumpets. Leviticus 23. It says, And again the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel. In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a remainder of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. You shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Now, this feast is known in Judaism as Rosh Hashanah. All right, it's never known as that in Scripture. Okay, that's added later by the Jews. Now, there's several things about this feast that I think is very interesting. First is, this feast was celebrated on the first day of the month. Now, you understand that Israel used a lunar calendar. Okay, so the first day of the month is a very significant. Second, it was celebrated on the first day of the seventh month. And it was to be celebrated by, uh, marked by a blowing of trumpets. All right? So the Hebrew word here for trumpet, teruah, it means an alarm, a signal, a sound, a tempest, a shout or blast. Why is it significant that this feast was on the first day of the month? Well, the Feast of Trumpets is the only one of the seven feasts that begins on the first day of the month. And see, because the Hebrew months began with the lunar calendar, the new moon, the other feasts occurred towards the middle when you know, the moons were more full and there was a lot of light. At the new moon, the sky would be dark because it's just a very, very you know, thin crescent. And the beginning of each month was originally dependent on the sighting of the new moon. So they have to be out there watching and not sure when is this new month going to start. We don't know. It depends on the moon. And you got to, out there, you're watching for this crescent and the night's going to be very dark because there's just very little moonlight. And the precise timing of the new moon wasn't very easily determined due to weather conditions, a lack of witnesses. See, so in order for the new month to start, two witnesses had to see the new moon and come in before the Sanhedrin and give witness to the fact that we saw the new moon, and then they, okay, we'll start a new month. So, you can see it, you're not really sure when this is going to start. Until those witnesses came. And after the appearance of the new moon was confirmed, then the Feast of Trumpets could begin, and then the rest of the fall feast could be accurately calculated from that date. The Feast of Trumpets is also considered a high Sabbath. No work is to be done. Therefore, all the preparations for the Feast of Trumpets had to be done in advance, and you didn't know exactly when it was going to happen, so you had to be ready ahead of time. There was this idea of watchfulness as a critical ingredient in the Feast of Trumpets. The rabbis later added a second day to this feast just to make sure they didn't miss it. The need for watchfulness and preparedness in connection with the Feast of Trumpets is echoed and re-echoed through the New Testament in connection with the coming of the Lord, the blowing of trumpets, the resurrection from the dead. That's the significance of this feast. Look at Matthew 24, 42. Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know the day your Lord is coming. You know, that's, that's the idea of this trumpets. It's a, it's a time when you know, we're not really sure when it's going to begin. And the, the Feast of Trumpets is Israel's dark day because it occurred at the new moon. It was very a, a dark sky. Israel's prophets repeatedly warned of a coming day of judgment for the nation. It was called the Day of the Lord. It was to occur at the end of the Jewish age. The Day of the Lord was a time when the Lord would pour out His wrath upon the nation Israel. The prophet Amos spoke of this dark day of judgment in Amos 5, 18-20. And according to Joel 2.1, the trumpet was used to usher in the Day of the Lord. So this Day of Trumpets is all about the Second Coming. It's all about the resurrection, the judgment on Israel. See, we see the spiritual antitype of the Feast of Trumpets in the fall of Jerusalem and the parousia of the Lord. The resurrection of the dead that took place in AD 70. Thus, at the blowing of the trumpet in Matthew 24, the scene is set and Christ fulfilled the feast. Guess what month Jerusalem fell in? September. September. It was September. Um, Josephus writes this in volume 1. He says, The city was taken on September 8th, A.D. 70, after the last siege had lasted five months. That's Tishri. That's the Feast of Trumpets. And here's what's interesting. Any of you remember uh, back in 1987-86, Wisenot wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 88? 
In that book, he predicted the rapture would happen in September of 88. So he had the right timing. He knew it was in the you know, fall feast. He was way off, but you know, by 2,000 years, but he was in the right area. And now we got uh, camping is predicting that May 21st, which doesn't fit anything, you know, biblically, the coming happens in the fall. And that's the thing. Most scholars, even most futuristic scholars, have the idea that, you know, the coming of the Lord is going to happen in Tishri. It's going to happen, you know, in the fall, in these fall feasts. That's, that's the prediction. That's how these all fit together. So the trumpet is blown at the resurrection. And Paul equates the resurrection of the dead with the sound of God's shofar. What are the similarities between the resurrection of the dead and the Feast of Trumpets? Well, they're both to occur in an unknown, undetermined day or hour. And secondly, they're both announced by the sounding of this trumpet. The blast of the trumpet is a type of blast that called the faithful home to be with the Lord. But it's also a blast of judgment on the rose of Christ's rejectors. And we saw the nation Israel is judged at this time. So we see that the, the Feast of Trumpets fulfilled the resurrection of the dead, which immediately precedes the day of the Lord. Both are heralded by this trumpet blast. We see the type of this feast in Joshua chapter 6, with the destruction of Jericho at the end of the 40-year Exodus period. Seven priests, with the ark of God in the midst, marched with seven trumpets around the wall of Jericho for six days. On the seventh day, they marched around seven times. At the close of the march, the trumpets were blown, the people shouted, and God caused the walls of Jericho to collapse, and victory was complete. Seven, 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 seven. This whole picture of completion. Remember, when the Hebrews give you a number, they're not thinking numerically. Okay, There's some symbolism behind the numbers. Primarily to them, the numbers are symbolic. The events of Jericho, I think, offer a graphic image of the actual prophecy of events at the close of the Jewish age. Forty years after Pentecost, when there were seven angels with seven trumpets of doom and judgment. Now here's an interesting side note. Ancient Jewish tradition held that the resurrection of the dead would occur on Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets. That's what the Jews understood. They understood. They're getting some of it anyway, okay? They know about when it's supposed to happen. And reflecting this tradition, remember, they call it Rosh Hashanah, it's the Feast of Trumpets, reflecting this, Jewish gravestones were often engraved with a shofar, a trumpet. God's last trumpet and the resurrection of the righteous are intricately connected in the Bible. Well, let's look at the sixth feast, which is the Day of Atonement. On exactly the tenth of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall humble your souls and present an offering by fire to God. Now, the Day of Atonement, this is Israel's sixth instituted feast day. It's to happen in the autumn of the year. It's on the 10th of Tishri, the Hebrew calendar. Uh, tenth day, the seventh month, which is, corresponds again September, October. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was the most solemn day of the year for the people of Israel. It was often simply referred to as the day. It was a day of atonement was made for the priest and his family, the community, the most holy place, the tent of meeting, and the altar. It was a solemn day. And if you examine the Scriptures concerning the second coming of Christ, you're going to find that it uses Yom Kippur terminology when speaking of Christ. And I wish we had time to go into it, but we don't. Like I said, that's on the website. If you want to look through that, it's some fascinating stuff there about the language used for this day of atonement. The day of atonement, people, speaks of consummation of redemption at the return of Christ. Now, as I said, it's interesting that you know Yom, the Day of Atonement is so far down into the feast. It's at the close of the feast. But look at Luke 21, 28. But when you see these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Now, the, these things in the context here is the destruction of Jerusalem. The destruction of Jerusalem, the second coming of Christ, and the fullness of redemption were synonymous events. The redemption was not complete until Christ returned. And that's why the Day of the Atonement is near the end of the feast because it's the consummation. That's when redemption is completed. The seventh and final feast was the Feast of Tabernacles. Speaking to the sons of Israel to say, on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, 
is the Feast of Booths for seven days to the Lord. All right, this was the seventh feast on the seventh month. It was to last for seven days. Again, the number seven, the biblical number of totality, of completion. This is the grand finale in God's plan of redemption. And this Feast of Tabernacle is the most joyful and festive of all Israel's feasts. I mean, to, to read the rabbis and the writings, the things they have to say about this feast, it was just a glorious event for them. It is also the most important and prominent feast mentioned more in Scripture than any of the other feasts. This feast also served as a historical backup for the important teaching of Jesus in John chapter 7 through 9. He is at the Feast of Tabernacles when he gives the teaching on John 7 through 9. And it's significant when you understand what's happening in Tabernacles and you understand what he is saying and you put those two together, that passage comes alive. I believe that Jesus Christ, who is the living water, was born into this world during the Feast of Tabernacles. I know that doesn't fit December 25th, but <laughs> get used to that, you know. <laughs> the Feast of Tabernacles was to celebrate and commemorate the end of the wandering in the desert for the children of Israel. It was called booths. They made themselves little booths. They got palm branches. They all made little booths. And, you know, went all, I mean, it was just an incredible feast. It also was a celebration of their inheritance into the land of Canaan. They would reached the promised land. That's what Tabernacles is about. And the anti-typical fulfillment came at the end of the 40-year transition period. After Jerusalem fell, the old covenant came to an end, the new covenant was fully consummated, and the inheritance of the new heavens and the new earth had arrived. Where it is said that we tabernacle with God. Tabernacle speaks of the final rest as well as the final harvest. The Lord not only gathered His people, He began to dwell with them. Look at uh, Revelation 21.3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And He shall dwell among them. And they shall be His people. And God Himself shall be among them. You know what's so sad to me is that so many futurists read this passage and they go, oh, I can't wait for that day when God will be with His people. How sad is it to miss something you have right now? God is dwelling with His people. See, there's no longer a separation. There's no longer a veil up at the temple and we can't get to God. God's in the Holy of Holies and we're separated. That no longer exists. That is torn down. And God now is with His people because our sin has been dealt with. And He can bring us into fellowship with Himself. Listen, believers, all theologians will agree that these seven feasts relate to these redemptive events. They'll all agree. Passover is about the death of Messiah. Unleavened bread is a burial. First fruits is resurrection. Shavuot, the birth of the church. Trumpet is about the parousia and the resurrection. The day of atonement is about redemption. And the tabernacles is God dwelling with us. But they fail to see the typology of the 40 years. And so they separate these feasts, not by 40 years, but by thousands of years. And they're saying, oh, we can't wait for the rest of the feast. They're not, that separation is not biblical. You can't break them off and say, oh, this will happen some other time. It started to happen when Jesus died and within a generation, all this took place. Every bit of it. And to still look for things to come about that have already you've received is just, I think, sad. And you know, I can remember myself reading Revelation and think, wow, I can't wait. God's going to dwell with His people. And then when you realize God is dwelling with His people, we have access to God 24-7. I can talk to Him anytime I want. I can enter into His presence. It is, it is incredible. The book of Hebrews makes it clear that the Exodus and the 40 years are a type that is fulfilled in the New Covenant. The Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Day of Tabernacles take place in the seventh month. And again, the number seven is the number of perfection and fullness. In these feasts, the believer is brought into the fullness of the Godhead. These feasts picture redemption. They're given 1,600 years before this ever happened. They were given by God to Israel, but fulfilled in the church, showing us that the church is the Israel of God. Believers, today we stand complete in Him. We are waiting for nothing. Nothing. We dwell in the presence of the living God 
and we always will. The only significant change that will take place at death is you'll drop the body. I can't tell you what that'll be like. I've never been out of mine. But everything spiritually, all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus have been received by us. We have them right now. It's just our responsibility to begin to walk in them. To realize what we have in Christ and live that way. Let's pray.